I'm Dr. Anthony Fernandez, Director of Medical Dermatology at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm here today to discuss the diagnosis and management of TNF-alpha inhibitor-induced psoriasis. Psoriasis is a very common chronic immune-mediated disease. It affects upwards of 2 to 3% of the world's population. And the introduction of biologic medications in the 21st century has revolutionized our ability to treat patients with moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. And currently, we have four classes of biologic medications available to us. The TNF-alpha inhibitors, interleukin-1223 inhibitors, interleukin-17 inhibitors, and interleukin-23 inhibitors. And of these classes, the first to be introduced were the TNF-alpha inhibitors. And currently, there are four TNF-alpha inhibitors that are approved by the FDA to treat moderate to severe plaque psoriasis in adult patients, etanercept, infliximab, adalimumab, and sertolizumab. And these medications have been workhorses for us over the past 20 years in controlling patients who have moderate to severe psoriasis. But like all immunomodulatory medications, they are associated with some potential adverse events. And of these, Arguably the most intriguing is TNF-alpha inhibitor-induced psoriasis or TNF-induced psoriasis. TNF-induced psoriasis is a psoriasiform dermatitis that is paradoxically precipitated by a TNF-alpha inhibitor. And this is a class effect. This has been described with every TNF-alpha inhibitor that is available to prescribe to our patients. And as of today, there are no definitively known risk factors for developing this reaction, and there are no known prophylactic treatments. For example, patients can be taking methotrexate at the time when a TNF-alpha inhibitor is started and during the maintenance phase and still develop this reaction. This reaction can also occur at any time point during the course of TNF-alpha inhibitor therapy, but research has suggested that the median time between the onset of a TNF-alpha inhibitor and the onset of cutaneous lesions is about 10 and a half months. And clinically, it can be very difficult to distinguish TNF-induced psoriasis from idiopathic psoriasis for several reasons. First of all, the morphology of the skin lesions that occur in the setting of TNF-induced psoriasis mimic the morphologies of the skin lesions that we see in the various subtypes of idiopathic psoriasis. And second, many of the conditions for which TNF-alpha inhibitors are indicated are inherently associated with an increased risk for developing psoriasis, including diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. So this can lead to very challenging situations for patients and providers in terms of making an accurate diagnosis and deciding the best course of treatment for the psoriasiform dermatitis that arises. Luckily, there are some clinical clues that can aid individuals in leaning towards a diagnosis of TNF-induced psoriasis as opposed to idiopathic psoriasis. For example, we know that patients who develop TNF-induced psoriasis more often develop pulmoplantar pustulosis as opposed to patients with idiopathic psoriasis. Additionally, scalp psoriasis is not uncommon in the setting of TNF-induced psoriasis, and when it occurs, it can sometimes be associated with extensive hair loss or alopecia. This is a patient of mine who has developed TNF-induced psoriasis. This was a young woman in her 20s who developed TNF-induced psoriasis related to infliximab that she was receiving for her Crohn's disease. And as you can see in the photograph on the left, she has thick psoriasiform plaques on the scalp with an associated extensive alopecia. And again, this is a degree of alopecia that we typically do not see in the setting of idiopathic psoriasis. She also developed desquamation along with pustules and reddish brown macules on her soles and palms consistent with pulmoplantar pustulosis. Despite these clinical clues and other clinical clues, in the real world, making a diagnosis of TNF-induced psoriasis and distinguishing it from idiopathic psoriasis can still often be quite challenging. And in those situations, a lesional skin biopsy may be helpful in allowing you to arrive at a definitive diagnosis. We performed a study at our institution several years ago where we compared numerous histologic features in a cohort of lesional biopsies from patients 
with idiopathic psoriasis to those of a cohort of patients who had TNF-induced psoriasis. And what we found is that there were numerous histologic features that significantly differed in biopsies from those two populations. However, we felt that the one histologic feature that would be most useful in real-world clinical practice is looking for the presence of eosinophils in a lesional biopsy. What we found is in, in the cohort of patients with idiopathic psoriasis, eosinophils were only found in about 18% of the biopsies. And when they were present, they were present in very few numbers. On the other hand, eosinophils were seen in lesional biopsies in more than 50% of the patients with TNF-induced psoriasis. And when they were present, they were often present in numerous numbers. Here we see photomicrographs from a lesional biopsy taken from a patient with TNF-induced psoriasis. And on the left at low power, hopefully you can appreciate that there's some thickening of the stratum corneum, there's perikeratosis present, and there's extensive psoriasiform hyperplasia of the epidermis. And in the right-hand photo, if we focus on the inflammatory infiltrate just below the basal layer of the epidermis, we can see numerous eosinophils. Some of them are highlighted by the black arrows present in that slide. Slide. And we're not the only group to have found that eosinophils can be helpful in making a diagnosis of TNF-induced psoriasis. This feature has been described by numerous other groups as being helpful and present in lesional skin biopsies of TNF-induced psoriasis. Once you feel confident about making a diagnosis of TNF-induced psoriasis, then you need to decide what is the best course of treatment. And the best course of treatment may not always be discontinuation of the TNF-alpha inhibitor, especially if it is controlling the patient's underlying inflammatory disease quite well. We performed another study at our institution several years ago where we reviewed the charts of 102 patients seen in our department and treated in our department for TNF-induced psoriasis and with long enough follow-up that we could assess whether or not the treatments were effective. And what we found is that a majority of patients could actually be treated with topical medications alone, and their TNF-induced psoriasis controlled in a way that allowed them to stay on their TNF-induced, or the TNF-alpha inhibitor. And in those patients where topical medications were not effective enough, the addition of systemic medications like methotrexate, cyclosporin, or even short courses of systemic steroids were often adequate to control the psoriasiform eruption and allow patients to stay on their TNF-alpha inhibitor. Here is our 20-year-old patient who developed TNF-induced psoriasis while taking infliximab for her Crohn's disease. And here she is about 11 months after starting methotrexate, 15 milligrams once weekly, and adding topical medications for her pulmoplantar pustulosis. And you can see she's had extreme improvement. She was quite happy with this degree of improvement. And this regimen allowed her to stay on the TNF-alpha inhibitor which continue to control her Crohn's disease quite well. This slide shows an algorithm for recommendations about how to approach treatment of TNF-induced psoriasis. And the first arguably most important question to ask is, how well is the underlying chronic inflammatory disease for which that TNF-alpha inhibitor was started being controlled? If it's not being controlled well by the TNF-alpha inhibitor, well then the best choice may be to discontinue the TNF-alpha inhibitor. That will typically result in resolution of the psoriasiform dermatitis, and then choose an alternative medicine that works by a different mechanism of action to try to control the underlying chronic inflammatory disease. If the TNF-alpha inhibitor is controlling that underlying inflammatory disease well, then the best option may be to try to treat the psoriasiform dermatitis. And the methods that you choose to treat are gonna depend upon the severity of the psoriasiform dermatitis. For patients who have mild TNF-induced psoriasis, you're typically going to use topical medications and possibly phototherapy. And for patients who have moderate to severe TNF-induced psoriasis, then you may need to add systemic medications. And if none of those regimens are effective, then you can con consider switching to an alternative TNF-alpha inhibitor. And although the data suggests that the TNF-induced psoriasis will often continue, 
that it doesn't always continue. And if you think TNF inhibition is important for controlling the patient's underlying disease, then you can try to switch to an alternative medicine. Otherwise, you may need to discontinue the TNF alpha inhibitor and switch to another medicine that works by a different mechanism of action. So in conclusion, TNF-induced psoriasis seems to occur as a result of a class effect and not a drug-specific effect overall. Most cases of TNF-induced psoriasis occur during the first year of treatment, but it can begin at any point during the course of treatment with the TNF-alpha inhibitor. The presence of at least three eosinophils in a single histologic section from a lesional biopsy taken from a TNF-induced psoriasis lesion can help you distinguish TNF-induced psoriasis from idiopathic psoriasis, and TNF-induced psoriasis lesions can often be treated without discontinuing the TNF-alpha inhibitor, but if you struggle to get the rash under control, the lesions will typically resolve when you do discontinue the TNF-alpha inhibitor. Thank you for joining me for this discussion on TNF-induced psoriasis, and please subscribe to Exchange CME's YouTube channel and check back regularly for updates and new videos.